apologize in advance for any issues of sound quality in the episode you're about to listen to. This chapter of the Poglywood Murders was recorded in self-isolation, with each of our actors playing their parts in their own house. <laughs> Previously on the Poglywood Murders. There's a little do at St. Mary's in Mornington Hill, April the 18th. It'll be 20 years to the day since the great fire of Morlington swept through the village. <gasps> Are you all right, Miss Nosa? Mr. Craddock? He's dead? Craddock? Isn't that the chap who found that painting in his attic? Eh? Riding the waterfall. The turner. Titty Twiglet down the placket told me that he'd been dead for a week. A week? That's right. Of course, that Dory knows that pipes up saying she knew he were dead as soon as she saw him. Ooh, she's awful, she is. I saw him, bold as brass, dancing round graveyard in middle of tonight. Saw who, my dear? Ernest Craddock. Well, that's quite impossible. He only had one leg. It were Ernest Craddock has spoken to him. No, you didn't, mother. With some chappy that works in Kenneth, remember? The Swifts and the Craddocks fought a bloody and terrible war that culminated in a fire at Craddock's haddocks, burned poor Mr. Craddock's face half off, and lost him a leg. His wife and ten-year-old child, too, apparently. They died? More or less. What do you mean? They moved to Blackpool. When you're taking down everyone's particulars, I'd like you to keep an eye on our friend the Reverend. Why is that, sir? There's something about him. Oh, my word. Elizabeth, what's happened? It's my mother. She's been horribly poisoned. Every orifice oozing bodily fluids in her face contorted into an almost inhuman expression of agony and horror. She was taking Digitoxin for her heart condition. She used to be bright as ninepence, you know. A prison governess, no less. You and your mother have been living here for 20 years, you say? Since Valentine's Day in 1917. I mean, I'll never find out how my father died. My real one. The Poglywood Murders, Chapter 8. A Fishy Business by Nigel Fairs. Unless I'm very much mistaken, it soon did like I. It was. That were Thomas Twiglet being thrown through the post office window. And that sounds like Sheila Swift and the rest of the Twiglet clan. Oh, mind yourself! Good heavens. Well, that seems to have sorted that. Sorted what? A situation. What situation exactly? It was Sheila Swift. She locked that rascal Thomas Twiglet in the store cupboard and was refusing to let him out. Hmm. And why would she want to do that? He neglected to pay for a first-class stamp yesterday. And she saw Red. When she saw him again this afternoon, that is. We all assumed he'd come in to rectify the non-payment situation, but no such luck. <laughs> a Twiglet owning up to any kind of responsibility? I don't think so. Aye, well, I suppose you'd know, laddie. Anywho, she started wailing like a wee banshee. Thus, as the last straw, she was screaming, Not again! And like I say, before any of us knew it, she'd thrown him into the store cupboard. I tried to persuade her to let him out, but before we knew it, the post office was full to the brum of twiglets. You know what they're like. I have to say, I got to the end of my tether, which is why I came out to look for a policeman. When I left her, Sheila was starting to foam at the mouth with fury and that Matilda Twiglet was threatening to poke her eyes out with a walking stick. All that was over a first-class stamp? Oh, no. She said it was so much more than that. She said that the Twiglets have been stealing from us for years and I have to say she has a point. There's near a good penny among the whole lot of them. Well, I must back to the post office. Uh, just a minute, Mrs... Mass. O'Dors. Patricia. You can call me Patty. Patty O'Dors. 
I or post office part, seeing as I work at the post office and my name's Patricia. Isn't it rather late for a post office to be open? Aye, well, we weren't strictly open, you see. We were having a stock check, and Tommy Twiglet popped in to give Sheila a wee special something, or so he said, because he's keen on her, you see. And she would be keen on him too, I think, had he not stolen the stamp. Oh, she loves a bad boy, does Sheila Swift. This wee special something, what might that be? And how wee was it? Very wee. But as they say in the Highlands, it's not the size of the sporran that counts, it's how you handle it. But of course, in the Highlands, first appearances can be deceiving. What with the cold air, if you get my meaning. I think I do. Oh, dear. That window will need a spot of fixing. I don't suppose you're any good with a sheet of glass and a handful of putty constable. I'm afraid I'm rather busy. Oh, aye. What were you doing cycling down the street like a kelpie laddie? I was on my way to St Mary's. St Mary's Church? Aye. I mean, yes. Inspector Sixpence telephoned me to say that he suspects that Miss Noser may well be suffering from the effects of digitoxin poisoning, which is apparently what killed her mother earlier this evening. Doreen Noser is dead. Yes. And if it's true about the poison, then the murderer may still be... Uh, just a minute, miss. Where are you going? St Mary's, of course. i got to go and check up on my wee pinky. Uh, who? Uh, just a moment. Two minutes past seven o'clock. Or thereabouts. That's interesting. Is it? Yes. I think, yes. That's exactly the time Miss Sputum told Sergeant, me. Sergeant, would it be all right if the congregation and the ladies of the choir go home now? If we're not going to perform the rest of the concert, that is. Did you just say we're not going to perform now, Dickie? I'm afraid not. And it's Sergeant Dingle, madam. Don't be daft, Dickie. I'm not being daft. I'm on duty. Right. If we're not going to do it, I'm off home. Just a minute. Joseph! Has anybody seen my Joseph? I'm afraid we can't let anyone leave the church quite yet, madam. Will you please stop calling me madam, Dickie? It's very irritating. Did you call her? Mrs. S. Ah, there you are, dear. Will somebody please let me know what's going on? Oh, Lord. I'd like a lift home, please, Joseph. Oh. Of course, Mrs. S. Are you my chauffeur? Uh... Ladies, I'm afraid you can't oh, just... do be quiet, Betty Swallocks. If any one of you lot wants to talk to any one of us lot, you all know where we live. Everyone knows where everyone lives and what everyone's up to here. And if you're ever in doubt about who it were that put their smalls out on Wednesday last on Lesby Avenue or left a pram unattended on Mallington High Street, then all you need do is pop over to the post office and ask Sheila Swift or down to the placket to ask Titty Twiglet. So don't you go telling me that we all need to sit freezing our buttons off in St Mary's for hours on end whilst Dicky here writes our names down on his little notepad. Oh, what is that? Oh, shut up, all of you. That's one of my collection plates. What in heaven's name is going on here? Dicky, stand by the front door. I'll get everyone to form an orderly queue... And when they pass, you take their name and address. You're not being treated like a common cow. Cheese it, Miss Sputum. It might have escaped your attention, but a murder has taken place this evening, and we need to establish everyone's movements at the time it took place. Whether we do that here or in the comfort of your own homes is neither here nor there. Well, actually it is. It's either here or it's there. And I know you, you'd rather be there than here, but... First, we need to take everyone's names. So, we either do that, or you stay here all night. But you... Bet me no bets, Miss Sputum. Sergeant Dingle, set to. Now. Uh, yes, Betty. Did you want something, sir? Only to say that you're a remarkable young filly, Miss Swallops. A credit to the force, not just a pretty face. Thank you, sir. If you'll excuse me. Of course. You go ahead. Right, everyone, get in line by the front door and give Sergeant Dingle your <coughs> name and address. Are you all right, Miss Lisa? As a matter of fact, she isn't, Reverend. I'm taking her to the cottage hospital. My constable will be arriving at any moment to give you a helping hand here. Really? Why? Well, you know, Dongle will be one man down, won't he? And as capable as Miss Swallox is. No, I mean, why are you taking Elizabeth to hospital? Ah, uh, Miss Noza. 
Would you mind showing the Reverend your handkerchief? Yes. But isn't that blood? Oh. oh. Oh, good grief. Are you sure you're all right, Reverend? Perfectly. Thank you, Miss Swallocks. It was the blood on her handkerchief, you see. I'm not very good with blood. Obviously. I suppose you must think me a silly old fool. I wouldn't necessarily call you that. Reverend Alting, before the inspector and Miss Noza left for the hospital, Miss Swallocks told me that by her estimation, the dastardly Doreen was done in by the deadly dose of digitoxin at 22 minutes past seven this evening. A time that a key eyewitness claims that you vanished from the church, only to reappear just before the concert started. How do you account for your sudden disappearance, sir? I, uh, had to go to the post office. To post a letter? To get my baton. Your baton? I'd left it there. I needed it for the grand finale. Not that I need have bothered, as it's all been put on ice. Oh so to speak. You don't seem very happy about that, Reverend. Well, I'm not, frankly. How inconsiderate of Mrs. Noza to die when she did, eh? Well, it was hardly out of character. Oh, really? Didn't you like her, Reverend Alting? Of course I didn't like her. She was a mean, vindictive old witch. I tried so hard to make her like me. I shopped for her, I did her laundry, collected her prescriptions, mucked out that ghastly pig in her back garden. Oh, that horrid thing. The noser's own a pig. If I were Betty Noser, I'd have the wretched thing put down. So would I. I'm sure you would, but... That infernal woman. I even scraped her corns and massaged her bunions. Disgusting. And all for what? Exactly, Reverend Alting. All for what? What? Why did you do all that for dastardly Doreen, Reverend? What could you possibly have to gain? Well, Reverend Alting? I did it, uh, I did it for the church. For the church? She said she was going to change her will, leaving a huge donation to St. Mary's, and I mean huge. Apparently someone had given her some shares in a tin mine when she was a prison governor up north worth thousands and thousands of pounds. Oh, really? But she said she'd only do it on one condition. What condition, Reverend? She'd do it if I married Elizabeth and gave the old witch a grandchild. Seriously? I begged and begged her not to make me do it. I shopped, I fetched, I carried, I even lent her one of my cassocks for her revolting pleasure-me-in-the-park panty parties. Pleasure-me-in-the-park panty parties? But she was adamant. She said if I didn't marry her daughter, the church wouldn't see a penny. Oh. Just, just just, a moment, Reverend. Although I realise that possibly Miss Noza might not be in the first spring of youth, she is a darn fine filly. A pip of a woman, in fact. Surely you could have at least married the girl. No, I couldn't. I simply couldn't. Why on earth not? Because, because I'm musical. I wear a green carnation. He's a bum bandit, Dickie. In the church of all places. It's hardly unheard of, Sergeant. Yes, but not in England. It's nothing sacred anymore. That explains why you're so good at needlepoint. And all them pretty stories you write for the children down Sunday school. Just because he's a good writer, that doesn't make him a fairy. Next thing you'll be telling me is that Noel Coward is one of them at all. Oh, I don't think so. What do you think's going on, Betty? Hmm? Don't ask me. I'm just the pathological assistant. You might be that. But you heard what Silverspoon said earlier. You're definitely more than a pretty face. Stop it, Dickie. (laughs) Still holding a flame, are we? No. Thought so. Miss O'Dor. Right. Where is he? Where is he? Panky. Who? Reverend Alting. He's gone back to the vicarage for a lie down. Right. Just a moment, miss. Aren't you post office Pat? Aye. What of it? I thought so. And who might you be? That's Sergeant Dingle, that is. Yes, thank you, Gunstable. The name's Dingle, Detective Sergeant Richard Dingle, and I'm currently in charge of this murder case. There's been a murder. I already told you that. Aye, but I wanted to see it. Now then... At 22 minutes past seven this evening... How odd you should mention that precise time, Sergeant. Is it? 
Why, yes, because that's when Pinky, I mean, the Reverend Alting, came to the post office to fetch back his baton. He arrived a few moments after the Twiglets came in demanding we Sheila let their Thomas out the cupboard. Beg your pardon? It's a long story. He noticed the time because he said he had to be back at St Mary's for 32 minutes past seven. And I said, well, laddie, we've only got ten minutes then. To do what? To fetch back his baton. Really? It would take him ten minutes to pick up a baton? Aye. But the post office is just across the village green from the church. Hardly ten minutes away. Aye. What was he really doing there, Miss O'Dor? If he was actually there at all. Of course he was there. I told you. He was picking up his baton, like I said. He left it there last week after all the fuss with the stuff in the church. And what might he be doing with the baton in the post office in the first place, Miss O'Dors? I don't see that that's any of your business, Sergeant. Don't you now? No. It's like my old mother used to say to me. There's those that know and those that tell, Patty, my dear. And there's those that don't know and don't tell, and there's those that know that don't and those that know that do, and there's those that don't know they tell anyways. Everything will oot, Sergeant. You mark my words. Everything that needs to come out will come out in the wash sooner or later, and if it doesn't need to come out, well, there it shall remain, hidden from sight. What was the Reverend doing with his baton in the post office last night, Miss O'Dors? We were re rehearsing. Rehearsing what? A wee ditty. What wee ditty? That's beside the point. That man might be a priest, but I'll have you know he's a hell of a musician. A musician? Aye. He's the cat's pyjamas. And what exactly was he doing with his baton? Yes, thank you, Constable. That's quite enough. There are ladies present. Where? Me. Oh, sorry. I'll have you know. I can be as ladylike as anyone else when I haven't got my hands on a stiff. I know that, Betty. My I... old mum used to say I was sophisticated. No. <laughs> what are you laughing at, post office Pat? You wouldn't know a sophisticated lady if she leapt up and slapped you in the face. Common as muck, that one. And a criminal to boot. What's that, Betty? You ask her. I will. Miss O'Dors? What she means is I spent a few years in the big house but I'm what they call a reformed character now. The big hoose? Loving at his majesty's pleasure. Oh, really? Where and when? I'd rather not talk about it. It were in Gradley. Where is that then? Lancashire. How do you know that then, Betty? All that was a long time ago. And I'd rather not talk about it. Can I remind you that you are involved in a murder investigation, madam? No, I'm not. I've only just got here. That's beside the point. The very fact that you're here at all this evening means you are very much involved. And very much a suspect. I yes. Thank you, Miss Wallace. That's as may be, Sergeant. But it was a different life. I've done my time, and I've got the mental scars to show for it. But at the end of the day, I survived the bullying ways of that hideous woman. And I've made a new life for myself in the post office. What hideous woman? Hideous women, I said. The inmates. Please, Sergeant, could we move on? If the Reverend isn't feeling very well, I'd like to go to see him. I'm sure you would. But that's what I don't understand, sir. Why would the Reverend Alting tell me that he was a fairy? If he isn't. Did Post Office Pat definitely tell you he isn't? Well, no. Well, there we go, Sergeant. It's a dangerous thing to make assumptions when we're dealing with anyone in these villages. Nothing is ever as straightforward as it seems here, I promise you. <laughs> I thought you might have picked that up when we had our little trip up to the yard. You mean that the Reverend is involved in all that business? I'm not saying that, no. Well, not necessarily. You're inferring it. No, Sergeant, you're inferring it, but I most definitely am not implying it. Eh? What we do know is that at 22 minutes past 7 o'clock last night, the Reverend and Miss O'Dor were doing whatever it was they were doing, with or without that baton, in the post office. Several of the Twiglets saw them go upstairs when Constable Niblett questioned them about that stamp business. So neither of them were murdering Mrs. Noser. That still doesn't answer. All that can wait for another episode, Sergeant. Now, didn't you have some foot powder to buy? No, I... Oh, yes. 
Sorry, I forgot. There's a bit of a queue, sir. Then I suggest you join it. All right. Hello, Dickie. Oh, hello, Miss Sputum. It was so lovely seeing you strut your stuff down at St Mary's last night. Strut we nothing. don't often see you in here. No, well, uh, I need to buy some uh, foot powder. Oh, dear. Corns, is it? Um, Athlete's foot, maybe. Um, what are you in for? It's my hemorrhoids, dear. I'm a martyr to them. I'd usually ask my Joseph to pick me up a tube of cream, but I happen to know that tonight he's got bell ringing directly after he finishes work, so... Your Joseph, you said, madam. That handsome young man at the counter. Yoo-hoo! Morning, Sybil! He moved in directly after you moved out, Dickie. Oh, he keeps his room immaculate, he does. Could eat your breakfast off his bedside rug. Sure you could. He looks the type. Will you introduce me to your friend, Dickie? I mean, I caught sight of him last night, but we didn't have no formal introduction. Oh, yes, this is... Sixpence. Detective Inspector Arthur Sixpence, Truro Police. Sergeant, I wonder if I could ask you something. Of course, sir. You said that Miss O'Dawes was detained at His Majesty's pleasure for a while. That's right, sir. A large tube of the preparation, please, my love. Um, the Gradley Prison for Fallen Women in Lancashire. There'll be one and nine. Thanks, Joseph. Gradley? Interesting. Is it? Well, surely you've heard of the Gradley Herring scandal. What's that, then? Something to do with fish? Sometimes I despair of you, Sergeant. The Gradley Herring was one of the most corrupt prison governors ever to have... Goodness me. Bye then, Dickie. Do pop in for a cream slice next time you're in the village, and you can come too if you like, Inspector. Uh, thank you, Mrs... Uh... Sputum. Sybil. Sputum. Miss. Miss Sputum. Yes. I used to be a missus, but then he died, and now I'm a miss again. Who died? Mr. Sputum. But you don't want to hear about any of that. Don't I? Uh, no, you're right. I probably don't. Can I help you, sir? Bye-zy-bye, then. Foot powder, please. Bye-zy-bye. Foot powder, coming up. Thank you. Did I hear you talking about the Gradley Prison for Fallen Women just now? Um, yes, we were, as a matter of fact. Why? Do you know it, sir? Well, I should say so. Foot powder, two bob. Two bob? Well, it's the best. It certainly is. I thought you'd gone. They had to come back for me corn pads. Oh, well, I suppose if it's the best. Yes, sir. My great uncle founded the Gradley Prison for Fallen Women in 1899. Gordon Gradley. You're joking. Well, yes, as I am, as a matter of fact. And why mention it? <laughs> You're right, Sergeant. Is it? I thought we were in the middle of a murder investigation and you want to waste time buying expensive foot powder that I don't what even... You say? You're investigating a murder. Look, sir, I don't know who you think you are, but... Yes, you do. I assure you that I don't. Your inspector just said it. I, I heard him. So did I. Said what? My name. Joe King. Joseph King. Most people call me Joe. You are joking. Yes. I see. Yes, sir. We are investigating a hideous murder in mysterious circumstances, and if you or your customers know anything that might be useful... I could tell you how many beans make five, if you like. Five. Very helpful. Or what Odeon stands for. Oscar Deutsch entertains our nation. Does it really? Or how many steps there are at Blackpool Tower? 1,036. How in heaven's name did you know that? Because I used to climb them every day back in 24. Worked on it, you see. Painting the spanking new steelwork. Hard work, but rewarding for a sweet 16-year-old. What's the next question? <laughs> this reminds me of a quiz they had on the national programme the other week. On the wireless. This is fun, this is. No, it isn't. It's a murder investigation. Sergeant Dangle. It's Dingle. Has someone else been murdered? You are joking. No, that's him. Oh, for pity's sake. All right. There's no need to blow your wig. Precisely. If you wanted something to calm you down, Dickie, I can recommend a dry shampoo at Madame Lala's on Truro High Street. I swears by it. She does. I picked her up in the tin can yesterday morning and she was high as a kite, weren't you, Sybil? I <laughs> was. Chin wagging away. I was. Mind you, if you do go, I wouldn't light up a coffin nail for a few hours. Some of their clients have been known to go up in flames. They have. Honestly. The thing some people go through for a Marcel wave. It's worth it, though. Don't you think, my love? Oh, yes, Mrs. S. You look hotsy-totsy, as my old mother would say. God bless her poor departed soul. You know, we never usually have this much fun in Thrippet and Longbodies. And they're a bit dry in here. I couldn't believe how miserable they all were when I started. Were they, Joseph? Oh, yes. Well, 
This is a fine how do do, I said. I like to get the customers smiling myself, you know. Crack a joke or two. Tell a funny little story. He does, you know. He has me laughing like a drain sometimes when he gets home for his supper. Oh, tell him about that story about that woman that comes in for her anal fissure cream. What was her name? Addock. Rake. Some sort of fish. Oh, I, uh, I don't remember that one. Yes, you do. You said she came in last week and was such a moaning mini you nearly threw her out. Heron. That was her name. Doreen Herring. Doreen Herring? That's a name and a half, I said to Mrs. Tiddles. Her what works up Pugly Hall. And she said she knew her, and Herring was actually her maiden name. She only used it for prescriptions. That's right, ain't it, my lover? You all right? No, uh, yes, I, 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 I mean no. Uh, I mean yes. The Swift Craddock Haddock War. Which year was it? Oh, that's a good one. You're good on wars, aren't you, Joseph? Ask him. Go on. Joseph? Just a minute, sir. Keep up, Sergeant. Spitspot. Are you going to tell me what this is all about, sir? Presently, Sergeant. Presently. What was that slip of paper you passed to Mr. King at the chemist? You saw that, did you? Well done. Of course I saw it. And where are we going now? Post office. You need to buy a stamp. No. Oh, good grief. I'm sorry, we're closed whilst the work... And a very fine job they're doing too, by the look of it. Oh, it's you. Yes, Miss O'Dawes, it's us. Can I buy a stamp, please? I don't think we need bother with that, do you, Sergeant? I thought you just said... I wonder if your workman might like a tea break. Laddies, I put the kettle on a few moments ago. Who's the bar? Maybe you'd like to eat. That's better. What is it, Inspector? Have you found the person who murdered that poor woman in the church last night? I think I might have an inkling. What was her name again, Sergeant? Um, Noza. Doreen... No, Sergeant. Her maiden name. The one she uses for prescriptions. Oh. Inspector, what exactly are you? Herring. Doreen Herring. Does that name mean anything to you, by any chance, Miss O'Dawes? Aye, that it does. I thought it might. It was a long time ago. That the hideous it. woman! I beg your pardon, Sergeant? At the church. You were talking about your time inside. I've done my time, and I've got mental scars to show for it. But at the end of the day, I survived the bullying ways of that hideous woman. And I've made a new life for myself in the post office. What hideous woman? Doreen Noser was Doreen Herring. I. The fush. The Gradley Herring. She made my life hell in there. So you murdered her? No, I didn't even recognise her. But I can't honestly say that I'm unhappy that she's dead. Of course, and that's understandable. No, Miss O'Dawes, we already know that you didn't murder her. You were doing whatever you were doing with the Reverend and his baton upstairs. I told you Who I... did murder her then? A daughter? She might have wanted to before she changed her will in favour of St. Mary's, I suppose. Though all that was rather muddled by the complications around the Reverend. What complications might that be? Never mind that for now. I don't think it's Mrs. Nose's murder that we should be concentrating on. Eh? You mean someone else has been murdered? Who? Ernest Craddock. That's what I said yesterday. And you poo-pooed the idea. Did I really? Yes. Well... He didn't pursue it in any case. And did you? Well, no, not really. I, I thought, because you poo-pooed it. Quite. Just a moment. I thought that Ernest Craddock died of natural causes. Sitting on a pew at the back of St Mary's, wasn't it? He did indeed. But natural causes exacerbated by being locked in an ice house for quite some considerable time before that. Sans his wheelchair which the murderer abandoned on the village green, before or after Doreen Noser had seen him carrying the corpse into St. Mary's Church. The fush saw the murderer. She did indeed. Although she thought he was dancing, and she thought he was Ernest Craddock. Well, no, I'm completely lost. So am I. Oh, how long have you been standing there? Would you care to join us, Mr. King? If I must. This place is a bit of a mess, Mr. Dawes. Aye, 
That's the twiglets for you. I brought you your prescription, Inspector, like you asked. Thank you. Very kind. I'll take it with my tea in a minute. You do that. I certainly will. What were you saying about that old woman seeing Ernest Craddock dancing with himself in the graveyard? I don't think that's what she saw, Mr. King. I think she saw Craddock's son dragging the corpse of his father from the ice house to St. Mary's. He had a son. And a wife, both of whom left him in 1917 to move to Blackpool. The son would have been, what, ten at the time? which would make him about 16, 17 in 1924. When he got a job painting the Blackpool Tower. Yes, Sergeant. And now he's returned to Cornwall after 20 years, having heard about another rather more valuable bit of painting. Oh, the Turner painting in his attic. Riding the waterfall. Exactly. Riding the waterfall, which he was doubtlessly hoping to inherit. Oh, how clever of you, Inspector. I think so. When did you realise it were me? I mean, I were me. When I worked out that that poor woman would have known your burnt and crippled father before his tragic accident. She arrived in Cornwall on St. Valentine's Day in 1917, and he was burnt beyond recognition two months later, on April the 18th. She saw you working in the chemists, and her addled brain thought she was seeing your father, and then yesterday morning in Madame Lala's... She told my landlady all about me. Thankfully, my landlady was I on dry shampoo, so she didn't really know what she was hearing, but I knew I had to get that old arid out of the way before she started telling anyone else who I was. So you came to St. Mary's this evening to administer the fatal dose. Easy as pie for a chemist. It could have been the perfect murder if it hadn't been for that wretched woman. Curse you, sixpence! He's getting away! Oh, no, he isn't. Yeah. Whoopsie-daisy! Get off me, you... That's quite yeah. enough, ah. it, sir. Well done, Noblet. It's Niblet, sir. You really shouldn't, Constable. It'll drop off. Ah, Dongle. How do you do? What are you up to? I just bought a copy of the Morlington Herald, sir, like you suggested. Did I? How extraordinary. I wouldn't be seen dead reading that tosh. What? But you I said... I see the post office window's gone in already. That was swift work. <laughs> if you pardon the pun. Yes, sir. Well, like they say, when Sheila Swift puts her mind to something... I've just got to pop in there myself, as a matter of fact. Got a message to pass on to her from Betty Noser about her pig. I visited her this morning in the cottage hospital. Oh, yes. How's she doing, then? Remarkably well, as a matter of fact. Was it the same poison? As a matter of fact, no. It's TB. Oh, dear. Oh, dear indeed. But she's rallying. Got the constitution of an ox, according to the doctor I spoke to. Wibbly? No, he seemed quite sober. Uh, Dongle, about that business at the yard, it's... I've had a telegram. All very hush-hush, in code, of course. What did it say? Let's just say that I think we might be popping in on Boothby Hall someday soon. The Pollocks? Yes, Sergeant. The Pollocks. Next time on the Poglerwood Murders. My son's secretary's brother, dear. He murdered his wife. No! <laughs> Veruca. Oh, my dear Veruca. I just discovered an herbal stiff under her ladyship's table. He says they found a dead nun in their dining room. There's a lady out there on the platform who's trying to attract your attention, so there is. Why would the Pollocks want to hush up the murder of your sister? Who the devil are you? Where are you? But he's got a gun, Miss Twigler! <laughs> You have been listening to Chapter 8 of The Poglywood Murders, A Fishy Business by Nigel Fares, with Abby Harris as Elizabeth Noozer and Patty O'Dores, Nigel Fares as Detective Inspector Sixpence and Baroness Pippin, Radley Mason as Constable Niblet, Max Day as Sergeant Dingle and Madame Lala, Rebecca Crinian as Betty Swallocks. Dominic McChesney as Reverend Elting, Anthony Townsend as Joseph King, with special guest star Louise Jameson as Sybil Sputum. 
Sound production on the Poggleywood Murders was by Nigel Fares, who also composed the music.